you in the the last um um in the last yeah so in the last um in the last century he was seen as the the ideal the um booker t washington booker t washington right have you read his book oh my goodness so you guys it's it's on youtube you can listen to it but he it's called up from slavery he started as a slave from the very beginning he talks about how slavery was a disservice both to blacks and to whites and he's how like when they got off the plantation everybody had kind of the mentality of a 12 year old Mm -hmm. but the slaves knew how to work and they use that to be in a better place even to the point like they'll say we hear about all this hostility but in the reality slaves were paying for out of love they were paying for their former master's children who didn't have any abilities they were so weak Mm. and it was an interesting and then i was also listening to thomas soul and he was talking about how i thought this was hilarious ghetto culture is really just southern culture but southern culture from the coast of england so this is the way that people picked up so when when people are like i i hate this person because they happen to be a different color than me they're literally acting their culture is not coming from as people will say it's part part from africa part from whatever that's not where it's coming from it's literally the behaviors the attitudes the the Mm. mindset Mm -hmm. is coming from another side Mm. so it's interesting it's been an interesting thing to talk to kids about this week or this month oh wow that is really interesting um that yeah it's fascinating what how much our minds have changed about these things and our culture has changed yes wow they've eradicated um booker t washington and one of the things that he did was the rosenwald schools so they were really cool because they would um they would give seed money and they would tell them that you need to um i um rosenwald julius rosenwald was from sears and roebuck and he would say i will give you money to start building your school but you have to finish it on your own and i think that that is the correct way in all of these situations if you want to grow resilience in a person they have to have skin in the game Mm -hmm. so it's it was just it was brilliant and now we have w.e.b du bois who is a socialist and believes in entitlement and he's Mm -hmm. lifted up as the highlight of everything well for those who are just joining us we're live i've got christine Stephen walk with me here today and carrie bartholomew and this is a series of conversations that we've been having for, I guess, a long, a, quite a while, over a year now. Christine, you and I met for the first time in December or January of last year, and we've continued this discussion series. A lot of our conversations focus on education and therapy and therapy education and and what's going on, the politicization of both, I guess, education and therapy. And, and uh Carrie, I guess we would have met at the end of last year, or no, the year before, at the end of 2022, and you reached out to me, and we had, we've been having a series of conversations, and these have just kind of come together in this really nice way, where we're able to connect frequently, the three of us, and um, exchange ideas, and talk about culture. So I'm really excited to have the two of you here today for a conversation, and thank you for joining us in the chat, if you're here with us in the chat um there's so many things happening it's been a while since we've talked um there was a recent email that i sent you christine yes i forwarded you from the school to which we were both re- previously affiliated yes. i i was a student a graduate student at antioch university and you were a professor at antioch university different campuses so we didn't know each other during that time but um they are a major counseling educator right now in United Mm -hmm. States. So they have a number of different campuses and online programs, and they're a major training program for new emerging counselors and therapists in the United States. And they're very, very ideological. They're very woke. 
very they in in fact we we played a clip if you guys want to look for it we went over a recent their last year's graduation ceremony where the chancellor stands up and says we are woke and uses that language so i'm i i know that's a cheap word but it's their own word they use it they have admitted that they're only training therapists who are going to be able to work with people who vote for democratic candidates they are anti republican which is really interesting um they won't they train counselors explicitly who won't be able to work with trump supporters they've actually said that um and so this is this is what's coming out and and this to me is very concerning for reasons that we've all spoken quite a bit about and that's that we have such a, a mentally fragile group of young people right now in the united states who are really kind of falling apart at the seams don't even know what their basic gender identity is and who are being heavily indoctrinated by their education programs who have been put on screens for years now instead of connecting in real life the i i'm start i'm still talking with families who are dealing with the after effects of the covid lockdowns on their young kids whose mm -hmm. kids were tremendously hurt by the isolation that they experienced, not just isolation, but isolation. And then here's a screen. So here have unfettered access to the internet. Mm -hmm. And so we have a group of, of a cohort of young people who are very vulnerable and strange to us in some ways that we're not sure how, how does this in, in affect growing and developing minds? We're still learning that. And the answer that our government wants to, to push us towards is more therapy. Mm -hmm. Let's get more therapists in the schools. Let's pay more attention to the kids' mental health by introducing them to mental the mental health system. And there are a lot of us who have been, uh, like Christine, you and I did this one conversation a while back that we recorded where I think we even titled it, Therapy Will Make Your Kids Worse. Yeah, we did. And so there's reason to be concerned about this. And then we were just talking before we went live Abigail, Abigail Schreier came out with a new book. I'm really excited about it. I want to read it. And it's about this topic about kids. Your kids are not, why the kids are not okay. It's something like that. I, I should go and look at the title. But one of the things she talked about in an interview with Barry Weiss was a mental health screening that was given to her or that a doctor attempted to give to her 12 year old son recently, I guess, after she'd written the book, she said. So it was pretty recent. Um, she was in for a completely different ailment, a stomach ache, and she was asked to leave the room so that they could administer in private a screening tool to her 12-year-old kid with without mom present. And she said, I'd like to see it first, which was great. It was really smart. And what it says, this screening tool asked five questions. It asks, in the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? In the past few weeks, have you felt that you or your family would be better off if you were dead? In the past week, have you been having thoughts of killing yourself? Have you ever tried to kill yourself? Are you having thoughts of killing yourself right now? And so it puts a kid through these questions, not based on prior disclosure of suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. just cold. Just, we've got you captive in this room. We're going to make your mom go in the other room and we're going to ask you these questions. These are so blunt. What about these suicide questionnaires that try to couch it in a careful way? What happened to that? This is just coming right at it. And uh, so I'm going to stop talking now and give you guys a chance. But Christine, what are your, you know, what are your observations? Well, this is something that we were kind of chatting about earlier, but um, my concern is that we know that that age group, I mean, up until a certain point, even in late adolescence, they're very malleable and they're very much into, um, you know, thinking about, you know, things can be presented to them, ideas can be presented to them, they can begin to adopt as their own and start using or start thinking about, they're not full-fledged adults yet who have their kind of, you know, thought processes worked out and their kind of moral structure is sort of in place. So when you start to give kids things like that, when they're not even thinking about it, it starts to make suicide an option. And this might be something that's very, you know, controversial for me to say as a therapist, because I've worked with kids that were suicidal at very young ages. But part of the problem with making a huge 
deal about this and bringing it out is that it starts to draw in a lot of attention and it starts to draw in a lot of copycat type behavior. And it starts to draw in a lot of, you're kind of in a cool group now because it's trendy to be depressed and it's trendy to be suicidal and it's trendy to think about killing yourself. You know, back in our day, you know, to date myself, when I was young and growing up, those weren't the options. I went through periods of depression, but there weren't those weren't the options that were presented that somebody ever said, hey, are you thinking about doing this? Would you do this? And not only that, when you have the schools then kind of parade around, you know, how um, how much suicide's happening and, 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 and there's a way to handle having those kinds of discussions without making it be a cool thing to do. And just to give a little bit of context around that, you know, I worked at, and I've shared this before, I think even here, Leslie, with you, that I, I worked at a care clinic that um, was on a campus of a high school. And we had um, a group of kids that were, that had a suicide pact with each other. And we were spending our days running around trying to find out where the kids were, who, who was in the pact. Nobody would give up each other's names, but the amount of attention that they got, the amount of time out of class, the amount of, you know, going to and from the hospital and the parents coming in and out of this, the counseling offices repeatedly over and over again. We spent the better part of a year to maybe this even going into the second school year. We never did find out who was all in the suicide pact, but the kids that were, you know, talking about it and, and um, the representatives of the group ended up getting a whole lot of attention and a whole, there was clearly something going on there, but what they used to get the kind of need fulfilled that they were having was, was to talk about how they're all going to, you know, kill themselves together. Once one goes, the rest are going to follow not one single one of them ever attempted anything, by the way, just as an FYI, it never happened. So I'm not saying that wouldn't happen in another scenario, but in this one, it didn't. And what you're talking about, the 12 year olds is, is, is slightly different. But my point here is that when you start to make it an option and you start to present the idea as though it's something that's normal and natural, and you know, just of course, we ask everybody this and you're not even in there for a mental health purpose, then that starts to normalize very dangerous behavior that's mm -hmm. actually serious that we're trying to hopefully see less of among young people. So those mm -hmm. are my thoughts on that and why it's, it's, it's wrong. There's no perp, there's no reason for that to be brought up in a pediatric in a pediatrician's office when uh, anyway, I'll leave it there. Yeah. When, well, well, your, your concerns are echoed in by some people in the chat too. Um, Brandon Bergian says, yeah, well, if you ask me eight questions about killing myself, I'm going to start to think about it. And I fi says, I, well, I wasn't thinking about it, but now, and it's this idea that you're implanting this suggestion and you're doing it really explicitly. I mean, this seems like this is basic consumer psychology too. You keep yeah. repeating a concept and somebody's going to start thinking about it. You're, you yeah. just made us, and you've made a really strong suggestion. I've also noticed that that language is really, uh, it's it's really explicit in a time when a lot of our language is becoming increasingly euphemistic. Like yeah. how many times online do you hear even, you know, people who are so-called mental health um, promoters are talking about unaliving myself. Like they talk this really gentle way. They're not even going to use the word. And this is going to come right at a kid. Uh -huh. and, and one of the things that I think is really alarming about this also is the asking the parent to leave the room. Yes. This started, uh, I don't know exactly when it started. I've never done this with one of my kids. I've got four children. My oldest is 27 and my youngest is 10. I've never left a room and left my kid with a doctor. Mm -hmm. I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that mm -mm. now, but I worked at a pediatric primary care clinic, uh, in the, well, I guess I, my last year there would have been 2019, 2020. So I worked there for about six years. So from around 20. 14, 2015. So I started to notice a trend in uh, adolescent visits. They would ask the kid to leave the room so that they could ask a sexual health screening questionnaire or the, not, I'm sorry, they wouldn't ask the kid to leave the room. They'd ask the parent to leave the room so that they could be alone with the kid to ask sexual questions. And I found this really, really you know, unethical and disturbing. I understand why they think the kid's not going to answer some of these things if their parent is present, but maybe that maybe that's a cue you should listen to. Maybe mm -hmm. the kid is, you know, maybe there's a reason. And, mm -hmm. 
And I think if you're a child with your parent present, or if you're an adult who has a friend that you brought with you present, anytime you bring a supportive person from your actual life in to meet with a health professional, keep that person with you because they're going to help you process the information that you receive. There's not a special relationship with your doctor. Mm -hmm. That is a person that you've hired Mm -hmm. in order to consult about what might be going on with your health or what you might do better to be healthier. Mm -hmm. That's not some special intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. If you have something that you're concerned about asking, then that's a really specific thing that you should bring in and you should tell your support person, I have something I want to ask, but I'm going to do this. Would you mind if I asked the doctor this in private? Because there's something, you know, uh, could you step out for a moment? But the a, a child with their parent, mm-hmm. um, Carrie, what do you think about that as a mother? I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I'm This is part, this is another branch of the cultural revolution. The, however, you can get the kids into your mental health practice where you can become a change maker for them. So the change maker situation, I think I talked about this last time, um, 10 years ago, Michelle Obama decided that school counselors are now change makers. So their role has changed. It is no longer the role of helping your kid find, get into their class the right way. Um, or, you know, missing, missing class schedule or anything like that. It is now to find what their problems are um, and and to help them. Like we're suggesting it. So one of the things that's happening is kids are getting apps once a week that say, um, just checking in. How do you feel? Are you depressed? Those are coming from the school districts. So um, we also are passing bills about rural mobile health centers. Talk about cheap mental health. Mm -hmm. So we're sending out people who I think maybe have one or two years experience, and then they're coming out to rural areas. And remember their goal, why are they coming to rural areas? Because they want to remove the conservative values. Mm. All of it comes down to that. We just passed a law yesterday um, or yeah, law. Um, We're going to do free daycare. So we, so we have free, right? So free daycare starting at age two, but it has to be high quality. High quality daycare means that you have to have all of the woke mental health issues in your daycare for two-year-olds mm-hmm. from like, they can um, play with their genders. Mm-hmm. So, you know, queer their gender I- ideology. They have to read certain books that are only about, um, you know, I am enough. They're just, I was looking at a list and they're very narcissistic, right? So everything is about mental health because mental health, any way that they can grab your kids. And then the other thing is that they tri- triangulate. So your your counselor becomes mm-hmm. just as equal as the parent. Mm-hmm. That The person they see for one hour, once or twice a week, becomes just as equal, just as valuable in their life as their parent. Mm-hmm. I think that's extremely concerning. Yeah. Right. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Right. There's, yeah. the, it, it's just, it feels like a very kind of specifically pointed goal to weaken the, the mental health of these children or to weaken these generations. I think, I mean, that's when I start going into, okay, what's the real goal ultimately? What What's really happening here on a bigger level? But it seems like a very goal oriented focus to try to weaken our kids. And I'm not sure, well, I have my own thoughts on why that is, but the useless um, class, say that again, the The useless useless class, class. useless class. That's, Mm -hmm. that's the, Mm -hmm. that's the end game Mm -hmm. here. We are creating kids. Mm -hmm. I sent you guys that survey um, that was sent out to high schoolers in my district. One of the questions and the, the questions are, it's called my hierarchy of needs. Um, and the two of the self-assessments are, I have met this need or I am working on it. The second to the last one is, let me pull it up. Okay. I am able to do whatever I want every day. I don't need to go to school or work or have a job. Remember the answers here are, I have met this need or I'm working on this need. Mm. How does that help a kid be reliant? I was talking to my son the other day and I was saying, wow, you've had almost a year, three quarters of a year of school, of homeschool. 
And all of a sudden, it seems like you're thriving in a lot of areas. What's the difference? And he said, well, I'm not afraid of failure anymore. Hmm. Wow. So, and, and because he's not afraid of failure, he's, you know, getting A's, but beforehand he had so much pressure. And I think that's something Abigail Schreier says Mm -hmm. is that the, um, the kids are afraid to fail so much that they don't even try. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really common human problem, but there, if, if trying is just an option, then who's going to do that? I mean, if, if you could opt in and opt out, you know, that's not, I, I guess there's a question about what's the optimal level of adversity for someone. Uh, There was a, um, I, and again, I, I want to read this book and I want to really immerse myself in her thoughts about this before I start to offer perspectives on it, but just initial thoughts. One of the things that um, I, I saw this Twitter thread where someone was saying that, that uh, her book posits that we, our kids live in the freest society with the least amount of, of whatever, I guess, uh, adversity or, and, and yet they're falling apart and there's something counterintuitive about this. And then somebody else responded with a map showing the roaming distance of the, the actual level of a freedom, a freedom that an eight-year-old experienced over time. And so they, they used a, like a city map to show Mm -hmm that an eight-year-old in the the 50s would have had like a roaming radius of like a mile. They could go anywhere and be all over the place. And then it gets smaller and smaller until now the eight-year-old's roaming radius is its own house, their own house. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting too, as a counterpoint, like, are we raising people in a cage? And if you raise an animal in a cage, how is that? You know, we know this, like when you find these rescue wild animals that get rescued, they can't just release them back out into the wild because right. they'll be eaten and That's killed right. immediately. They have to somehow be rehabituated so that they can actually gain the skills that they lost by being caged. And so are we caging our children to some extent? And then coddling them, thinking that coddling is the thing that's going to give them the resilience and the resources in order to thrive. Right. And, and I, I don't know, there's that, that might be overly simplistic too that framework because it's really not either or, but there is a little bit of that argument here about how little exposure kids get to exercising the things that they need to be able to, to push against in order to gain confidence in their own skills. What I, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is the term dignity and what, where that comes from. And I think that probably the cruelest thing that we have done to our children, we've stripped them of their dignity Mm -hmm. because we have told them in order to be kind, you have to lie. You have to lie to others and you have to lie to yourself. You have to look at things that you know that aren't true, whether that be, you know, a bunch of people did not die during a time when you were made to stay in your home You Mm -hmm. couldn't hang out with your friends. You couldn't trick or treat, nothing. Mm -hmm. You were made to lie. And even now, now we have digital literacy, which means the kids are going to stare at something and they think what they're learning. When I talk to senators or whatever, what they say is we want them to be smart and to, you know, avoid pornography, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what digital literacy is. Digital literacy is another lie. Mm -hmm. It is all things vaccine related are mm-hmm. completely true when you should trust them mm-hmm. if they come from CNN. Mm-hmm. And our kids, some of them are smart enough to know or to have formed their own opinions. The same thing about being told that, you know, a, a boy who wants attention and is, is wearing a dress to school, you now have to address him the way he wants to be addressed. We're gaslighting our kids right and left. That's abusive. Mm-hmm. And no, that, go ahead. that that brings up something that's interesting because I was ta- I was having a similar conversation with a family member of mine, and um, I remember we had a I when I was still an intern, we had a student that was you know transgender, claimed to be transgender, male to female, and he was wearing skirts and dresses and things to school. Well, I used to work that this school is in, it was in what we call the triangle in Richmond, California. If anybody's familiar with it, it's like one of the most violent neighborhoods in the entire state. So gangs everywhere, it's not even safe to be by yourself 
even during the day, if you're not sure where you're going. Okay. It's one mm -hmm. of these things. And so I worked in a school where that was right in the middle, you know, it was the school that was in their community. So, um, there was, he was getting beat up a lot for doing that. And our answer to this child was not, you know what, you need to just be able to be you and keep putting on that dress and keep getting your, your butt whooped every other day. Our answer was this may be how you feel and that's fine. But if you're going to survive at this school and you're going to survive in the community here, you need to actually do things that are going to lead to that. That means you need to put on the pants, you need to put on the shirt and you need to leave that for another time. We didn't know whether that was the right thing to do or not the right thing to do because we didn't want to shut down, you know, a kid's desire to express themselves. But our job as the parents and the adults in the room were to keep the kids safe. And the kid was not safe. It was not safe to run around and do that. So it wasn't about be expressive. It was, why don't you be expressive when you're, you know, in group, you know, in, in the group in class and talk all about that. Why don't you be expressive when you're doing art and express, you know, these things, draw pictures of, you know, different things you want to wear. I don't know. We came up with whatever we came up with, but we needed to protect the kid. And lo and behold, we got him to stop doing that. And lo and behold, he wasn't getting his butt whooped every other day. And we were able to save him and protect him. I mean, that was the job because he was not looked at. And that wasn't so far ago. That was maybe in 2007. He was not looked at as somebody that knew what was best for him at that age. We had an understanding as the adults at school that we could not let him get his butt whooped all the time. So we had to say, no, here's a boundary. Here's a way to contain this. Here's, mm -hmm. you know, the line we have to draw. And the kid, like I said, not only was he safer, he ended up making a couple of friends. What happened to him after that? I don't know, but that wasn't what, what, what our job was. It was in the moment and we needed to do it now. You know, that brings up something interesting about bullying. And, yes. you know, we, I think it's, I think it's good that we are more aware of bullying because there are some terrible effects that, that can come from yes. that. Some, some, it can go too far and kids can like true bullying is yes. really devastating it's really hard for kids and anybody really i mean that's just that's too. basically yeah yeah it's like <laughs> it's basically mobbing we just call it bullying when it's a kid you know we yeah. call mob mob behavior and like scapegoating yes. and and yet there is other social behavior that is hierarchical and is how people sort themselves and figure out and solve their problems that isn't bullying, but seems to be lumped into that same category with teachers just making policing everybody's thoughts. And I think that that's so there's the idea of the helicopter parent. Yes. Who hovers and tries to solve all problems and remove all challenges from their child. And so the child doesn't have a chance to do that for themselves. And one of the things that I noticed about uh, about myself and about friends and just just this sort of observation about the nature of mothering is that in order to not helicopter, you really need to be at a bit of a distance. You need to give the kids some space because the closer you are and the closer your observation is, the more you're going to tend naturally to try to solve problems and to help help work through these things. And that's, there's a, there's a, I think a wisdom to just like give them some space. So you're not closely supervising all the things that your, your kid might be doing at an age appropriate level, but you want to scaffold and help when there's a crisis for your kid. Like there's, you know, actual big problem. Well, let me help you learn how you can solve your problem. But if you're standing over them, then you're going to perceive more problems and you're going to find more opportunities yeah. to intervene. And so when kids are living in this really highly supervised environment and we're teaching, especially I think of young teachers who haven't had their own children yet. Mm -hmm. being in charge of large groups of children and supervising mm -hmm. them very closely and being very attuned to watching for bullying behaviors, mm -hmm. how they could start to squash all squabbles yeah. and tell them all, you know, no, 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 no. And, and not allow the kids to define their pecking order and their hierarchy. Yes. Does that make sense? I'm trying to approach this in a nuanced yeah. way and not Yes. Not make a declaration. I don't think bullying to learn is good. How to problem solve and how to resolve yeah. conflicts with each other yeah. a little bit on their own. And to do that, you have to be a little uncomfortable and you can't mm -hmm. have somebody constantly intervening and speaking up for you. It's one thing to, to do that. Something else we're not saying run wild, you know, and allow kids to be 
you know, the crap out of each other every other day. I mean, you're talking about something, Leslie, that's more about skills you need to develop to conflict, mm-hmm. to do conflict resolution as you get older and to learn how to start formulating what you believe to be right and wrong and how you want to be treated and what you observe doesn't work or does work. You need to have some space to do that without being rescued in every moment. And that's, Mm -hmm. I think, an excellent point. And it's something that our kids are sorely, sorely lacking. Well, and some kids, go ahead, Carrie. Some kids like it. And I don't mean like it, like they like to be bullied, but Mm -hmm. they, they can recognize that, that, that freedom to be able to figure out who they are, where they fall in line. And also it gives them, it's the best life lesson for them to be able to figure out and to go, oh, if I continue to do this really annoying behavior, people are going to, you know, they learn how they want to be. And they, I mean, I'm talking to somebody with, with a teenager who completely is like, there is a role for bully. Not that he is a bully, not that he gets bullied. He's just like, the fact that you learn how to behave, like you said, you learn that pecking order. But I think our kids recognize it. I think our kids know far more than we give them credit for knowing. But when it comes to bullying, I believe that bullying, since it, when it first came in, it has made the problem worse, like so many of these other ideas, because certain people, it was okay to bully, and certain people, it's not okay to bully. And when, when you know, as a kid, when you start to figure out, oh, if I'm in this group, I can bully others Mm -hmm. and it's fine because if they get upset with me, I'll just say, well, they were, they offended me and I'm special. Mm -hmm. And so we have been dividing our kids probably, probably since 2008, I think is when I started to see a lot of the whole anti-bullying culture. We never bully. We have a no policy bully et cetera, et cetera. You can't bring a Nerf gun to school, you know, all like these things that really strip down who kids were. And a lot of times kids who like, I remember my son getting a call or getting a call to come and pick my son up from school. And he'd never been in trouble before. And some kid, he was the new kid. We just moved here. And some kid was scraping on the back of his heels. Mm. And he finally turned back and walloped the kid. <laughs> and And then he, being who he is, went to the principal and turned himself in. Hmm. And that's, but, and then those two people worked it out and they became friends. Mm -hmm. Because, but that, there's that natural thing that we're stopping Mm -hmm. and we're making it so people are afraid to even to engage with each other. Well, and in speaking of, of that natural engagement and the, the, the duking it out, the solving conflict on their own, this process of learning how to interact through trial and error. Um, Something occurs to me, I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about this, but we, we have fewer children now, families are smaller and birth order plays a role in temperament and personality. And so we have a culture that's made of firstborns. Yes. And only children. Yes. And, and middle child. Yes. You know, so we have like this one, two and three kids. And that's pretty, it's pretty rare to see families that are larger than that these days. I mean, it's, you do, but it's not that common. So how many firstborns do, and how is a firstborn different? And how is an, a middle child and, a, and how is an only child different? And you think about taking these differences into adulthood and then how we will then interact with the world and how, you know, there's dynamics between parents when you have an yes. only child that are different, that are, I, and I, I carry, that's your, your situation. You're, you have yes. just one. And it's, it's, it kind of, it's like the hovering helicopter mom. If you, so I have four, but I have two and two because my daughters are two years apart. And then there's a 13 year gap. And then I have two sons. And so mm-hmm. they're they're and they're two years apart. So I don't really know what it's like to have a gaggle of children and my older two and then my younger two are much more like firstborn and secondborn and then firstborn and secondborn than like first, second, third, fourth, if right. that makes sense, yes. birth order wise and the way they were treated in family. But one thing that is is just unescapably true is that a mom who already has a toddler can't pay as much attention to her baby mm-hmm. as a mom who just has a baby mm-hmm. for better or for worse. And I think in some ways for better because the, the baby... Mm-hmm 
uh, you can't pay as much attention to that toddler. So the toddler has to learn to meet some of their needs because you're paying attention to the baby. And the the baby also has to do some self-soothing early on because you're putting out fires with the toddler. Mm-hmm. And so both kids end up with some resilience building opportunities, yes. which is, I think, a product of, I would call it benign neglect. Like I'm not there to help all of your, to solve all your problems. And they're real problems. Like if it's a baby, mm-hmm. they're crying. A newborn is not crying out of a need for manipulation. They're crying because they have needs. They're cold. Yes. They're wet. They're, they're hungry. But when there's a delay in getting those needs met, but then they still get met, that, that ends up being a, a yes. something that teaches and informs the personality and temperament of that person. And that's they're more laid back. Development. That's, that's child that's development. What, that's what we teach. Childhood mm-hmm. development 101 teaches that very concept that you're talking about, about how you get the infant to self-soothe and the importance of having them mother themselves for a moment. Um, and, and what that does for the, for the development of the child, it's mm-hmm. actually a very healthy way to parent. Mm-hmm. And so, how are you going to do that as a, as a mom yeah. with just one child, you can't, Are you going to just decide to neglect? No, you're not probably going to do that. If you're a loving mother who's got all the right instincts and all the right desire, you're going to be unable not to respond to your child's needs. How do you manufacture that kind of experience for your child? It's really, really difficult to imagine being able to do that. That's what school's for. There's school. There's also just being a very intentional parent. So one thing that I would do is watch other kids so that those so you can create those experiences where your child has to wait has to share has to Mm -hmm. um has to socialize you it's it's hard um having secondary infertility was hard because you I dealt with depression because Mm -hmm. I I wanted desperately to have more children and then we fostered so he has experienced being the oldest before um but I think it's still, I think it's still about like, you want the best for your kid. And so, and you recognize that there, there are things that they're missing. And so because they're missing those things, you, you, you have to manufacture them. Mm-hmm. So it's another, it always comes down to me to best practices. What are best practices? How do we implement them? And then to bring it full circle and everything else, we aren't implementing best practices in so many ways. It's like you take a list of this worked, this worked, this worked, this worked. And instead you replace it with, with fragility. You call resilience, you, you rebrand words like resilience. And meanwhile, your kid is bawling because they, you know, didn't get an A on the test. Mm -hmm. They can't just go, oh, I think I'm going to work harder. Even, even now we have our testing is so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You can test and test and test and test until you get that A and -hmm. that's the grade they'll take. And that's not resilience. That's not really overcoming Mm -hmm. and saying, I'll do better next time. I mean, that's faking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it is strange the way we try to kind of backwards engineer some of these things. And it's like you said, Carrie, if you want, you're, you're a parent, you're also socially aware and you have these desires for your child and you see that they're not met within your family, the the optimal conditions aren't there. Like you wanted another child and you don't have a sibling for your son. And so how do you try to create situations for him to flourish and for him to learn the things that he would have otherwise had opportunities within the family to learn? And you're trying to do that. And I think that that's, I think that there's an awful lot of that, like some of these things are good, well-intentioned. I really do think that a lot of the attempts to provide more mental health care to kids are not necessarily some kind of evil plan. And in fact, when it comes to that, like conspiracy thinking, like who's, what's a conspiracy theorist? I feel like there's a, there's a, um, a slandering of people who are basically, I guess, central planning skeptics. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you are skeptical of centralized bureaucratic, bureaucratic uh, policymaking, then you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, we can point to all these things and we can say, look, there, there is an attempt 
to centralize a lot of power and control over population movement. And that's yes. clear. And it's not conspiracy theory to call yes. it out and call it Thank what it is. You. Thank you. And yet at the end of the day, I'm also not personally, I'm not as interested in calling that out as to, as I am in saying what I see. It's like, right. this is what is happening and this, and what do we do about that? Right. And I think what we do about this is we respond and we realize that our healthcare system isn't what it was when we were growing up. No, I mean, we're all in our forties yes. and we live in a different, this is different. We didn't live in a time when the doctor would have kicked mom out and given us a suicide survey No, or a sex survey. Like I would have been mortified if something like that had happened. And my mother would have been pissed. It wouldn't have happened. And now it's becoming more and more normal. I watched a shift because I had the opportunity to have kids young and then older. So I had kids when I was, I had my first at 19 and my last at 37. And so I had two sets of kids and I watched how the way that parents interact with the medical system around their children is different now, even just in that short period of time. P parents are being taught to rely on experts so much more heavily now than they were just when my daughters were young. And that's just, that's within my lifetime. That's not even comparing my childhood to my children's. That's comparing my children to my children. So there was a rapid increase in the way that parents have been conditioned to see doctors as experts. Mm. And then by extension, mental health professionals as experts, and now teachers as experts, like your teacher can yes. actually know. So, and so I, I think we need, we really need people to pull back and, and own their own authority, own their own sovereignty and their own autonomy over the choices that they make within their lives. And yes, be considerate of other people and think about the ripple effects that your choices have. Yes, do, but don't outsource your thinking to someone else. Mm. And we're talking about experts who've graduated from these current college systems mm -hmm. which that are all makes me hard. it's a little bit horrifying when when you it's, see how fragile people are when you talk to them and you have a different opinion than them and they literally walk backwards out of the room and you know if we can't if we can't start with agreeing then we can't have a conversation and you're just like really because i'm trying to figure out maybe you've got something to add to this conversation but instead we are told trust the experts which oh in psychology is not an exact science and we've walked in one direction, one direction, realized, Oh gee, we hit a wall. Oops. Now we got to go back and go in the other direction. How many times, countless times. One of the things that I heard the most from green therapists was, you know, I, I just, I wish that there's, I'm looking for the right thing to say to make that change in that person. And I want that person to, you know, whatever, there's a lot of agenda there that you have to kind of try to erase out of them as, as they're green and wanting to. So my point is, is that, you know, the experts quote unquote, aren't really experts on anything. That's really all that tangible. They're not there living in your day-to-day -day life with you. They're not there under those conditions. And we realize that we make mistakes all the time. It's part of the process. And it's part of being a therapist is consistent, continuously making mistakes. So when you have that kind of trust in experts, you're really just throwing, you know, the, the dice out and you're gambling and hoping that you land on, on, on something good. Mm -hmm. And you're not necessarily going to do that through the experts who they themselves are in a, a, a practice that doesn't really have a whole lot of clear lines around it. It's, it's really not, it's very gray and mm -hmm. it's very situational and it's very much what we know today is not what we know tomorrow. I mean, it's constantly changing. Well, and that's have, a problem. Have you guys heard about the Judith Butler um, when she talks about how life is drag? And basically everything is pretend. Everything is pretend. Mm -hmm. So then let's look at some of the experts today. Let's look at, not to get political, but I'm just going to use this person. Okay. Let's look at Fanny Willis. Oh, who I don't know who that dress. is. She's, she's, she's wearing her dress backwards. Oh, she... I never watched that clip. I saw people talking about this. What, <laughs> but, what will you set it up? Please. Yeah. Okay. So she is um, the AG who's suing one of the many places that's suing Donald Trump. Right. Mm. But this is supposed to be an expert and she's wearing her dress backwards. And I'm, I'm really sensitive to these because it's a ton of African-American women who are just ridiculously foolish yeah. and they're running for a po 
for for an office and as I'm doing the same I'm like try like I feel like I need a shirt that says not one of them you know <laughs> but, but but these experts are pretending so if if they're if they're an expert in leftism of some kind and they believe there is no truth but power as part of their thing then why in that are we trusting them mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm yeah, that's uh, that's mm-hmm. right on point with um, a comment in the chat. Two ladies, Midwest Adventures says one point is also that some of the experts are so narrow in focus that they miss the bigger picture. So challenging, and I was thinking about that that um, statement that when you when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. And I do think that there's that narrowing of focus and that failure to see the big picture. I mean, we think about like vaccine science, for instance, where we're being injected with all of these things that are meant to help us to target certain pathogens. But what what's being pointed out by other scientists is that there's an effect on the overall immune system and you've got chronic inflammation and chronic autoimmunity when you do too much exposure to certain things like aluminum adjuvants. And, and so, you know, it's it's interesting. It's, you, you see a narrowing of focus and yeah, maybe you're you're watching the thing that you're trying to fix improve, but you're not paying attention to all of the the extraneous and, and other variables that you're you're manipulating inadvertently while you're doing this one thing. And they're telling you to not trust your own eyes. So Mm -hmm. we saw a kid 15 years old working at a factory um, doing the summer job and he was very athletic and he completely fell down and, you know, had, had his heart issues Mm -hmm. from the the COVID thing. Yeah. And I just, and we're, so we're not supposed to trust that. Meanwhile, I've got a 12 year old at the time and they're pushing, you know, 12 year old, make sure you get this done. And I'm like, I've got a 12 year old boy. Yeah, For what? For what? <laughs> for what like, gonna trust risk of COVID is. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, and that's, that's the thing about going after the rural people, right? Because rural people tend to be, um, not always, but we're painted as, as backwood hicks. But the reality is, is that it's just common sense. Well, they're not as reliant on on interconnected systems. They still are having to provide more for their own lives. More of their own subsistence Mm -hmm. is on Mm -hmm. their own responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's painted as wrong. Mm -hmm. That's that's what our kids are getting in lessons. That's what our kids are getting in therapy. Mm -hmm. That's the, the whole goal is to completely turn our kids into progressives. Even if, and it's so crazy to me when people look around and they cannot be they cannot be bothered to get involved and well you know those people with their backwood ideas and you just sit there going you do know that that's going to be your kids right Mm -hmm. that's that's the truth a friend of mine just recommended this book mad in america by robert whitaker Mm -hmm. to me and i've been listening to the audiobook and he's going over the history of how mental illness has been treated and i I had to study this in undergrad and I think again in graduate school, they always make you go into the history of psychology because they're basically saying, look at all the bad things that people have done in the name of psychology or psychiatry. And, and now we're better. We see that. So we're, we know what not to do, you know, but it's always, this field has always been about, uh, what is socially normal? What is socially acceptable and good? So there's always been a sort of socio-political component because what what else are you comparing against? How do you make a judgment about what's mentally healthy? Mm-hmm. Yes, and it's right. so often been used to basically punish people who think and act differently than the, the standard approved mode, you know? Yeah. And I, I spoke with a guy, a couple of, months ago, who was a doctor in Canada, he didn't want to do a recording. He just wanted to talk about his situation. He he was not wanting to go public, but he wanted to talk about what was going on for him. He had objected to some of the DEI stuff. He's a, he was a um, professor, a doctor, and also a, a professor. Uh, and he was teaching medical students and he was objecting to some of the DEI stuff. And because of his objections, he was forced to go see a therapist. He was, it was a mental illness. You need to be retrained 
You need yeah. a psychologist or a, or a counselor to help you retrain yourself because there's something wrong with you that you object our, our spiel on race and gender. And so we see this being used now. I had that done to me when I was in um, graduate school. I, I had a, my professor recommended and put it on my permanent record that I see a seek therapy because I wasn't, a, a, I wasn't agreeing with their attitudes about white people. Yeah. Yes. So it's, you're, you're now mentally ill because you don't adopt this strategy. And I think that this is our chance. We still have, we still have every bit of the autonomy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, things are shrinking and things are scary, but we still have the power to say, no, thank you. I don't want to play by these rules. No, I won't. I won't use your experts. No, I won't. Mm -hmm. I won't think the way that you want me to think. I'll think how I think I should think. I'll use my own critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but is it really is as easy as no, thank you, mm -hmm. and it infuriates them so much to yeah. you know. But that's well, really... then it becomes gee, that parent's very resistant, and what is it that they're hiding? I can tell you, kind of behind the curtain, what we're saying, what we're thinking when when parents do that, which is, wow, what are they hiding? Why is it that they're not listening to us? What are they doing? Well, that's, you know, how could you not want to hear from an expert when we just want to help your child? So that's the, um, it's not a respect, it's not a respected choice. It's, it becomes, I mean, it's, it's not respected by others. You can respect your own choice, but those experts, when you say no, are not respecting you behind closed doors, that's which why is really problematic. You know, oh, go ahead. No. Well, I think we should do like a skills um, exercise on how to respond to things like this. I yeah. think maybe we should develop some sort of skills yeah. for like, um, I did that for like a, a, a pronoun video at one point. I put out oh, a video yeah. talking about how to- I got so many hits too. Yeah, yeah. People sure. liked that. And and I I had really given it thought. So I said, you know, I kind of feel like I've developed a way of responding to this question when I'm asked my pronouns that is not inflammatory and actually is an, enough off-putting to the other person, but doesn't inflame them towards me. And so it nullifies that, that question. It goes away. You know, it was, I just said, I have no, it's really simple. I just said, I have no special requests, which phrases it in a way that I'm, oh no, I'm not asking anything of you. And it, and it changes the script. It breaks the script that sure. they're doing. And, and if we, you can find script breakers, right. you can, avoid some of these pitfalls in a way that feels good to everybody. And here's a silly example. I need a script breaker for this. I love thrift shopping. And lately there's the Goodwill near, and I'm not crazy about Goodwill. I wish everything was just still independent thrift shops, but I will go to the Goodwill and they always ask you, would you like to round up to the next dollar yes. to support our job training programs? And the way that they're scripting, they're scripting this. It's like they're offering you something. Yes. And so the response that is natural in that format is no, yes. thank you. And I refuse to thank them for asking me for money. So mm -hmm. I'm, so I stand there and I go, no. And then it's awkward and they're irritated with me. And it's like, I was just having this nice banter with the cashier and now she's irritated because I just said no. <laughs> but So I need, I, I need, I need a script breaker. I was telling my daughter this the other day. I need a script breaker so that I can respond to that in a way that makes them realize what they just asked me, that they just asked me for money. So if people have a, have my script breaker out there, you can make suggestions, please. I would yeah, love to read them, them. The chat. but there's that like NLP kind of neuro-linguistic programming that sort of like artful use of language and consumer psychology yes. in order to make people more likely to comply with certain requests or, or whatever. And I, and I think that it's really I, I love cleverly coming up with ways to dodge those things. And and I love looking for them and recognizing them when they, when I'm being presented with those and then finding ways around them. So I think maybe we need a, yes, we need script breakers for all of the expert outsourcing. So when it comes to what I always tell people, because people are very hesitant for, to like learn about black history because they think and they're, they're not wrong that it becomes activism history. And in fact, they're calling it black history and culture so that they can usurp all of history and turn it into whatever. So what I always tell people is be more informed than they are. So my students, if they are asked 
one of the things that people will say is, well, your, your parents didn't tell you about this because they're racist and they didn't want you to know. So instead my kids can say, actually, I know about the wall Waldor, um, the Rosenwald school. I know mm-hmm. about Booker T Washington. I know about more people than they would know. Mm-hmm. And so that becomes the solution. And I believe that we have to have better solutions and that's how we win mm-hmm. always to have the better solutions when it comes to goodwill. I took those classes and I think they're great <laughs> So, because <laughs> when you're, when you're very low income, you can learn how to type and learn basic computer mm-hmm. skills and things like that. But I, so in that case, that's different. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think that if we have those solutions, that that is how, um, that's how we undermine them. Mm-hmm. Cause if you say, well, do you know who Elizabeth Freeman is? And they go, no. Oh, oh you, you don't but I do. And let mm-hmm. me tell you about her. And when a 15 year old can look at, look a teacher in the eye or look a guidance counselor in the eye and say, this is what I know. It's really hard because, and I have had people say, well, you don't really know the truth. And you're like, well, I can actually show it to you. Here's the example. Mm-hmm. I think that's really brilliant. And I think to be able to back up your knowledge is important, but there are times when you don't want to have to engage really deeply. True. And how do you just avoid it? If you're somebody who's, and I also, I know a lot of people will say, I, my mind doesn't work that fast. I end up being flustered in the moment. I don't want to have to call up this. I'm not going to sound smart. And so that's why I think little, little social techniques and, and phrases to help get you out of a pressured situation what about are useful. Today? What's that? I'll I, pass mine, today. Mine yeah. Is, I say, yeah. I say not today. Mm -hmm. No, today. I don't say thank you afterwards either. It's just a no, not today, or I'll pass on this today or Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. I I don't, I don't know if that's, if that's enough, but that's how I handle those situations. As I say, not today. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Neutralizes it and it's not inflammatory. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't have to give a reason why it's. But what if it's your child being, you're at the doctor's office with your child and the doctor says, Hmm. I'd like you to, uh, you know, uh, Miss Seifen, will you please step out of the room? I'm going to ask Johnny some questions now. Hmm. I mean, That's- there, there's that moment of pressure that I can imagine a parent who still brings their kid to the doctor, which, you know, some people have to. Yeah. I one of the things that I would suggest is that think really hard about whether those well checks are necessary. Right. And, and find a good doctor. If you don't feel like it's necessary to bring your kid to that doctor every year, maybe it's the doctor that you have. Maybe you need to change to someone who's respecting you more. But if you're in that situation and you're nervous and you're about to be confronted with either the, you know, some medical procedure that you don't want for your kid or being asked to leave the room, what are some ways that a parent can sidestep that? Role in, play with your child what, first. What you do. Role play with your child. Role what play, would you suggest? Have, well, you role play with your child. You say, this is what's going on. And you say, you say, actually, I'd like to have my parents stay. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. then the ki- kid's advocating for themselves and you can't. You Does that shift the them. pressure onto the kid to be able to, to because that, that assertiveness is hard for some kids. I, I think that's why you role play. You role mm-hmm. play and tell, and you explain to them why, which is sad that we're in a world where you have to explain that there are nefarious people out there, mm-hmm. but that's the world we live in. And so, and I, well, you that, sound like you have an exceptional kid. I mean, your son yeah. sounds like he's really a strong willed and very intelligent, very exceptional kid. And I have had, I, some of my kids are more assertive than others. I have, yeah. I have a couple of my own children and I know friends with kids who would, not even be able to speak up to the doctor, okay. struggle to even speak and sit there very shy and very, you know, um, and th- that would be not a thing that they would be able to be called upon to do in that situation. I, I think that this goes back to what we were talking about with resilience and teaching the kids resilience, because, you know, I was, when I was eight years old, I used to take the city bus all the way across town, 10 miles across town to get home from school. You know what's going on on the city bus, right? This is not the school bus. It's not, you know, a bunch of kids. It's a bunch of people of all sorts of different things going on. I had to learn how to protect myself. And I had to learn how to have a really big mouth and be like, stop talking to me that way. I mean, I will never forget. There was some older man on there that was trying to coax me off the bus to get off with him. And I had to be able to say, 
I don't want to get off the bus with you. Leave me alone. And I mean, I screamed it. I didn't say it in a nice, you know, kind of diplomatic fashion, but what that's all I knew was I, okay, this is wrong. This is bad. I'm just going to say no. So when they asked my mom to leave the room, uh, years and years later, okay. Uh, different, different story. So that's, that's, that's Christine learning to be assertive mm-hmm. years and years later, when they asked my mom to leave the room, it was because I was getting on the birth control pill because I had really bad menstrual cycles. And so it was not because I was going to be having sexual intercourse that was not uh, on my to-do list. And, and I, I wasn't interested at the time. And so they asked my mother to leave, uh, because I said that, I, you know, they wanted to know if I knew, you know, that that didn't prevent, um, STDs. Mm-hmm. Like, pregnancy. And I said, well, listen, Dr. Such and such, I've made a commitment that I'm not going to be having sex with anybody unless I am in love with them and we're going to get married. I mean, of course, back then that's what I really believed, (laughs) but I actually had the, the assertiveness to say that to her. And she kind of looked at me and rolled her eyes and said, well, we have to have this talk anyway. And I said, okay, that's fine. I'm just letting you know, I've already made my decision. And Mm. I had the balls to do that. That's amazing. That's amazing. I had all of that practice over those many years. That wasn't the only time at eight years old on the bus, but it's the most, I guess it's Mm -hmm. the clearest example I can give you where I had to kind of stand Mm -hmm. myself in a dangerous situation, but that did, those things happen repeatedly over time to where by the time I became 16 years old, I was able to say, that's fine that my mom's not here, but there's nothing I'm telling you here that she couldn't be here for. This is the decision that I've made. And because of that, I'm going to respect respect that. So I I don't think it's something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I I like what uh, Lorna Hartley says in the chat, we need to lead when children see that they model it. And I, my own suggestion would be if, if I'm in that situation is to say very little, not to elaborate on your reasons for Mm -hmm. not doing it. Just say, you can just decline. No, we we decline Mm -hmm. or no, no, thank you. And then Mm -hmm. that's it. And then if they want to press you can just keep politely re- repeating your no, no, thank you. We're, we're, I'm going to stay right. with my, my son or my daughter. Yep. And you know, if, if the, you can end up watching the other person try their persuasion techniques, but you stay firm. And that is really a good lesson for your child, not to apologize, not to elaborate. It's not your responsibility to assuage or convince them they are the one who's trying to persuade you so don't let them role reverse you to where you need to ask them permission to stay in the room with your kid you don't need that they need your permission yes and it doesn't have to be that your kid learns these harsh ways of being assertive because you know you're not around i mean in my my in my situation my parents just weren't around there was no choice but Mm -hmm. they worked a lot i mean they weren't off partying they were working Mm -hmm. learning english immigrant family you know the whole thing Mm -hmm. so there's ways to be able to teach your child how to do that without it being something that has to happen so aggressively in the way that for me, you know, my sister's older than me, but she, Mm -hmm. anyway, that that's a whole nother, but. I could see if, if your kid did that, like the assertive thing that you were capable of and the thing that Carrie was suggesting, and you're there as their parent to watch them model, watch them demonstrate that, then that could be a really good experience for the kid too, because they, they have your backing. They're learning something about standing up for themselves. I do like that. And I just think that not every kid is capable of that. And so it's good to have the parent have a strong and firm role in that as the parent is your job to protect your kid from, from this adult who's trying to be, who's trying to, to break a boundary. Yes. Trying to violate a boundary. Whether it's for malicious reasons or for benevolent reasons, they're trying to violate a boundary. That's a very good way of putting it. Just because they're following the the rules, they have to do this. Well, institutional violation is still violation. You know, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, if you're carrying out the orders, you're still responsible. What's the the very famous study? Was it the Milgram study where they're giving the repeated shocks? They're pretending to give shocks. And you saw how many people were willing to do something if it felt like it was based on orders. That's that compliance aspect of personality. Some people are very high in a desire to be socially compliant. Yes. And others are less so. But maybe that's something we need more education and discussion about. I think so. I mean, it's that's such an amazing study that 
I would have imagined more would have come out of that than what actually did, if that makes sense. What do you mean? I, I, it's, it's an amazing study. And I wish that that had been something we focused more on in psychol in school for psychology. I, I just, it just seems as though it was this big experiment that we learned a lot from, but we didn't do anything with, we didn't help people learn how to kind of push back or how to, you know, um, when you're feeling that something's wrong, how to walk, I mean, just simple things on how to walk out. I mean, there was a couple of people that were in that study that they didn't say no and sit there. They actually just got up and walked out. So they didn't want to face saying no to the authority figure. It was easier mm -hmm. for them to get out. Right. So, but using those kinds of things to teach people how to be assertive and how to advocate for yourself in a way that's, you know, respects your own personal values. You know, it's not so much about respecting, I mean, we're so worried about upsetting the authority figure, but what about respecting your own personal, you know, values and, and morals, moral compass? Because I think that's part of it is that we sort of lost a moral compass in the midst of all of this. Anything that's goes dignity. now. Yes, anything goes, dignity, right? We've lost that. When anything goes, then there is no containment. There's no direction. There's no, there's no groundedness. And that's there's just- in the chat, Ben Thorpe, a.k.a. Abel, that's an interesting name, a.k.a. Abel, um, compliance is not necessarily a bad thing per se. We are social creatures. I think that is a really good point. I, I, and that's a point that I've, I've made a lot in the past couple of years. Um, we, over the COVID lockdown, you saw a lot of division and a lot of people who were on the anti-lockdown side of things, yes. which is where I was, Yes, um, were really opposed to what was going on. You saw a lot of the anti-lockdown people start calling the the pro-lockdown people sheep Yes, in a really derogatory way. Yes. And I felt like, well, is it, this is one of the signs that you're actually an empathetic and um socially responsible person is that you have a desire to do what the the rest of the people are doing you feel some kind of desire to fit in mm -hmm. sure. if you have no desire at all then you're anti-social if you have no care at all sure. right for how you fit in with any with a social setting why is that i mean i think that the tension comes from caring about that but also having a critical thinking process that allows you to discern when you should do that Yes. And one of the things I thought was interesting when I was studying Latin a long time ago is that <clears throat> the root word Greg or Grige is this is this word that means heard. That this is the root of egregious, mm -hmm. which means uh, you know, offensive to or outside of the group, and, and gregarious, which is of the herd. And so at sometimes you hear us talk about the herd or the sheep in a in a really uh, derogatory pejorative way and sometimes you hear it upheld as like this is it's isn't it a good thing to be gregarious isn't it a bad thing to be egregious and so it's just how you're thinking about it i think i think that's um good point and ben thorpe aka abel says you ladies need a man in this discussion well it's always nice to have a good man in a discussion but i don't think we have to have one in every single discussion <laughs> just to meet and talk but thank you for your input <laughs> I always enjoy discussions with men and women. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, the and the compliance thing, I mean, I, I look with the whole COVID thing, I made a decision and it wasn't about, you know, my I, I don't feel that I became so aggressive about my decision and my choice until I was told that I wasn't, you know, participating in my civic duty to protect everybody around me. That is when I think I became very ignited and it turned into a, you're all sheep and, you know, screw all of you. A defensive response to that. Because of course, yeah. because the, what was put on me, I felt was a very judgmental and very negative. You are a murderer and you're contributing to the deaths and you're contributing to the problem. And that, 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 I mean, go on and on about, about that. And that's what I think it was very hard for me. It's one sense me to be so angry. It was very hard for me to say, you know, okay, let me treat this person with some grace and just say, I, I declined because I declined wasn't enough of an answer. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. You know, you couldn't just decline. There had to be 
there was a, there was always some kind of an argument about what you're declining to do, what you're declining declining to be compliant on, how that's causing other people hurt and harm. And I did mm-hmm. not really believe that was the case, and the science didn't really show that was the case. For me, it just came down to I'm not willing to lie. Period. I'm I'm mm-hmm. not willing to lie if if I see, you know. I was one of the first people who freaked out when I first heard of it, because that's my baby going to school. Sure. Is he going to, you know, fall asleep and, you know, fall down and die? That I totally thought that. But as I watched that not happen, yes, I had to go, what I'm seeing more than people falling down and dying is families hating each other. Yes. I'm seeing people not invited to certain things. I'm seeing people shame, yell, scream, spit, and I'm watching protests crammed as people are walking across bridges yes supposedly when we're all going to die yes so at some point I'm not <laughs> gonna lie and I'm not I didn't have to I would just call people and say look we aren't doing this if you would like your kids to have the social interaction so that they're not cutting themselves yes send them over yes that's fine with me but we I didn't get out and I wasn't all like in your face I never screamed at people I still have family that I'm very hurt by the fact that, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, you're eating outside. That's what happened. That that was extremely hard to watch. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. And Christine, I felt some of that anger too. I felt some of that. I, um, I tried to shift my thinking on it to Mm -hmm. see the herd impulse, the impulse to go along with everybody else as something that is inherently really beautiful about people. Yes. This is desire to connect and to fit in and to be like, but that it was being abused and manipulated and um, taken advantage of Yes, in this particular instance. Yeah. And that helped me to have compassion towards the people who were being, you know, I, I think I know we're, we're kind of, we're coming up on an hour or maybe we've just gone over an hour. I'm not sure how long we've been 71 minutes. So it's a little over an hour. So we should probably wrap up and, yeah. and this is a whole nother ball of wax but um it is it is interesting to talk about social compliance and how um how this is good and how this is bad how this is manipulated mm-hmm. i'm i had somewhere else i was going to go with that but I'll, I'll hold off yeah maybe for next time yeah well carrie what do you have com- coming up in your life anything interesting you want to talk about or any links that you want to send people to right now um, if anyone's in Utah and happens to be in my area, I'm running for a state school board. That's what I'm going. I'm actually leaving right now to go catch a plane to go to Texas. So that's excellent. Really, what I'm focused on right now. How about you, Christine? Well, um, we are starting to record um our new episodes for our podcast, and it's actually about parents of detransitioners so what the parents have been going through or have gone through as their children have been transitioning and then detransitioning so that should be a really excellent series we're excited about it and um, we're also developing a more of a peer consultation group type structure for students Mm -hmm. that are in school or interns who are looking for some support um, as they're practicing psychology and finding that the ideology has sucked everything dry. So we're trying to be the other, another option. So I'm excited about that because I get to work with students again. And that's always been my love. Well, that's really wonderful. Well, good luck to both of you. And those are really great projects. Thank you very much for this conversation. I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Thanks to everybody.